uh, tonight's service. I hope everyone had a nice day and um, yeah, you had some time resting and um, yeah, I just this evening I hope, um, I just hope you're able to, if you have any distractions, anything that's bothering you or anything that's, um, I don't know, stirring inside of you, um, which could stop you from um, listening to what God has to say. And I'd like to pray for that at the beginning, that God takes away any, anything that might be bothering you. I'd like to start um, tonight's service with a, with a passage that I read, I read this morning um, yeah, during my time with God. And um, yeah, it really challenges me and it really challenged me. Proverbs chapter 8. If we can open up Proverbs chapter 8, verses 1 to 4. Proverbs chapter 8, verse 1 to 4. Does not wisdom call, does not understanding raise her voice? On the heights beside the way, at the crossroad she takes her stand. Beside the gates in front of the town, at the entrance of the portals, she cries out, To you, O men, I call, and my cry is to the children. Do we really pay attention or do we to our lives and to what God has to say to us? Or do we just live our lives in a habit, just doing the same thing over and over again? Or do we actually pay attention to the crossroads where God throws something at us and knocks us on the head? Do we actually, are we prepared to change? So tonight, I'd like to pray and ask God that he may speak through Sam, that when he speaks to us on the topic of marriage, that we really consider what God has put on his heart to tell us and that we really pay attention to a crossroad where he's calling out, where God is calling out to us to change, that we really may be challenged and that anything that's bothering you or any distractions, that God may take that away and we may be open to hear what the Holy Spirit has to say through Sam. So let's stand up and start tonight's service with prayer. Father God, I thank you so much that you're with us. You promised to always be with us. God, I thank you so much that you've given us the Holy Spirit. We can read of it in your word that you gave those who were prepared to accept the Holy Spirit to lead and guide their lives. God, I pray tonight that you may speak through Sam, that you may speak through song, and also that you may speak through us together remembering what you did on the cross. Jesus, take away any distractions. Holy Spirit, may you minister to us tonight and may we hear boldly and clearly what you have to say to us. I thank you for everyone here. I pray that you may bless us and may we be filled with your spirit tonight. Amen. Please remain standing and we will sing our first two songs. Thank you.
few of us are not well and are not here, so we have uh, not as many people as we normally have. But I'll be doing a devotion through Luke chapter 22. Um, if we can open up Luke chapter 22, verses 19 to 20. And it refers to the communion table. Uh, communion is the time when we remember what Jesus did on the cross. Um, and for us, it means we have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And not only that, in, we know in Corinthians, we look forward for the coming of Christ. And it's a frightening idea uh, when we think the coming of Christ. Some of us want that to happen sooner rather than later. For us oldies, it's okay, but some of the younger people, especially the ones who've got kids, you think, what's the future going to be? In Luke uh, chapter 2, verses 19 to 20, um, we read, And he took bread and gave thanks and broke it. And he gave it to them, saying, This is my body, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Whenever we eat the bread and the drink of the cup, of course, it reminds us what Jesus has done on the cross for us. But it is the defining moment in history and our personal lives, I must say, and especially for those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. It was a defining moment uh, for the people of Israel in the Old Testament uh, during the Passover when we read that the lamb was sacrificed and the blood was touched or poured out and the, the sign of the blood was put on the door frames, on the lintels. And that means that uh, people escaped death. Whoever was under that, in that house. They escaped death, they escaped slavery through an intervention of God, and they received freedom from being um, slaves in Egypt. In Exodus 19, we read that uh, the Lord made an agreement with the people of Israel. Likewise, Christ is our Passover lamb, unblemished and perfect in every way. In him, there was no sin. And through him, we receive freedom from being slave to sin or to fear or to doubt. Because of Christ's death on the tree, we are no longer slaves, but we are sons, we are daughters, the sons and daughters of the living God. Romans 8, we read, because of those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God, for you do not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you receive the spirit of sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father, and the Spirit himself testifies to our spirit that we are God's children. Tonight, let us remember that as we partake in communion, that he has brought us victory over sin and death. The word of God tells us we are conquerors also. So tonight, as you partake in the bread and drink from the cup, remember that, that his broken body if you can manage that, and the blood that was spilt for you. Recognise who you are in Christ Jesus tonight, that you are sons and you are daughters of God. Continue to build your personal relationship with, with him. Know him personally. Experience him personally. So brothers and sisters, as we come to the table, I invite Greg to come and join me. Um, I know I haven't got a microphone, <laughs> you're going to get one. Um, as we come to the table, like I said, well, let's have that mindset. To think about what Christ has done for us in our lives and uh, accept it humbly with grace and with thanksgiving.
So hopefully you can hear me better now. Let's stand. When we read in uh, Corinthians, we read when Jesus took back, uh, when he had his last supper with his disciples, he took the bread and said, do this in remembrance of me. And we'll do that tonight. I'll ask Greg to pray over the, uh, the bread and sanctif- ask for sanctification and blessings. Our gracious God, we're reminded this evening of the love that you had for us and how you demonstrated that through your son, Jesus. And Father, if it wasn't for Jesus' death on the cross, then we wouldn't be here this evening. We wouldn't have this opportunity to fellowship not only with you, but with each other. So Father, as we take this bread this evening, may we remember that it's because of you and it's not because of us. May we have you as number one in our lives. May we not be distracted by the bright, shiny things around us, Lord, but may we remember that our eternity is dependent on you. And we thank you for the free gift that you've given to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Please sit down. Well, as we come through, if you partake in, in this communion, stand up and let us know. We'll hand the uh, plate for, uh, to you. Um, it's open to all brothers and sisters in Christ who believe. If you're not a believer in Christ and you're thinking about your situation, we ask that you may refrain from this um, and think of, it, of that relationship that you have with God or, or have not got with God, more importantly. And on the same night when Jesus stood up and he said to his disciples, drink in in this cup in reverence of me. And we'll do that right now. Let's stand up, we'll pray. (coughs) Heavenly Father, thank you for this institution that you've given us because of your love for us. 
for your desire to have a relationship for us and with us. For your eternity, we praise you for that. We thank you. And as, as we partake, let us and help me think the, the, the cost, the pain that you took upon yourself for me, for the rubbish that I do, this, the sin that I do, Father, and I just hand that over to you. And I just thank you for that. Thank you for the blessings that we have in you and with each other. Bless this time. Amen. Now please be seated. Rule two will pass by. Uh, we'll hand out the, the cups. If you can hold it together, and then as we come together, um, we'll all drink together and we'll pray together. Father, as we just partake in communion, it's not a sign of salvation or how good we are, but rather how, how depraved we are and how much we need you, Lord. Thank you for that. Thank you for your death and resurrection. We see and we want for you to come and we want to spend eternity with you. We know that this, what we see on earth is only temporary. It's not all, but we know there's good and better things to come. So we have hope in that. We just want to praise and thank you till you come again. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Could somebody go around and just collect the cups, if you don't mind? I think there's a bin at the back there. Thanks, Max. Thank you, Fred and Greg, for leading us in communion. Um, when my, like, my little boy... Benji plays soccer, and um, yeah, in the last game, it was a pretty aggressive game, and the boys were pushing and shoving each other, and yeah, he got a few knocks, he fell down a few times. Every time he 
He gets a knock and he's flat on the floor. He comes up and then he's looking for me. Like he looks, he looks at me and he's looking and then I'm looking and I just like thumbs up, like just keep going boy, keep going. And he's like, yeah, all right, gets himself together. He scores a goal. Same thing, first thing he's doing, he's looking for me. <laughs> he's looking for me like looking, oh dad, did, like, as if, did you see it? And I'm like, good job boy, keep going. And he feels after the game, he comes close like, and then you got this feeling that he feels he belongs. When I'm there, he, he comes close, he belongs. He belongs to me. The same feeling when I come home, you know, you've got a day at work, things going not the best at the moment, especially in the building game. You come home, straight, like, you're just under pressure. And then you come home and the kids hug you and, and you just feel that sense of just belonging. And you just feel a joy, it's just, yeah, this is where I belong. It's the same as with communion. When we take part in this, when we remember what Jesus done for us, when it's so real and when every time we take it, just remember that we belong. We belong to Jesus. Our identity now as believers is in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we can be at home knowing that fact that we belong and we have that peace. We can just breathe and say, I belong. And it fills us with a joy of the mess and everything going around us, knowing that no matter what happens, I belong. I belong to Jesus. I belong. So I love the time when we remember this together and it's a great sacrament that we have, what Jesus gave us that, we should do this regularly because it connects us and it reminds us that we belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. So thanks, brothers, for leading us. Yes, Sam, I'd like to um, ask you when you come up, if you could just tell us a bit about yourself, about your family. Uh, Sam is from Bundaberg. He's Jake's brother, Sam Swaddling, so... He will be ministering to us and blessings and we'll sing two songs. We'll stand up for the two songs and then I'll ask you to come up and share. Thank you. Let's stand up.
can tell this was written by somebody from Queensland, can't you? Ah, summer rains, not quite Adelaide. Okay, welcome. Well, it's great to be here. Uh, my name is Sam, as you've heard. I am Jake's younger brother, just pointing that out. Um, I am married to my wife, Beth, and we have three adult children. Our youngest is now 18. Um, so we got married quite young and had children quite young, unlike my brother. Um, and so uh, that's our journey. So I've been in full-time Christian ministry for over 20 years now, uh, initially working for a mission organisation. I took short-term mission trips to Africa, Bulgaria, Fiji, all around the place. Uh, and for 18 years now, I've been working in pastoral ministry. So roughly that's where we're at. And most recently, for the last three and a half years, we've been at Bundaberg. Uh, up in Queensland. So that's where we are right now. Happy to answer any questions you might have uh, after the service. Let's get into it together. Where would your mind go if you were to think about a great love story? A great love story. For many people, it might be Romeo and Juliet. For others, it might be Elizabeth and Mr. Darcy. For some, it might be Levin and Kitty, or perhaps Russell Ebert and Port Adelaide. Yeah, there's a few going there. There you go. Well, as great as those stories are, they don't necessarily help us that much because what we need to see is a Christian love story. What does it look like when a husband and wife are truly committed to Christ together? When marriage is more than sharing a last name, but it's a partnership in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that is what we'll be looking at together this evening, a practical example of a godly Christian marriage that we can look at to help guide our own marriages. 
So to do that, we're going to be looking in the scriptures at the example of Priscilla and Aquila to see what we can learn from their marriage. Now, before we get stuck into the story of Priscilla and Aquila, I just want to ask one question. Should we imitate our lives around Priscilla Priscilla and Aquila? Should we use them as an example? And I would say yes. The scripture tells us very clearly that's what we should do. Now, if you're going to try and follow along, maybe don't try just yet, because I'm going to move through these scriptures really quickly. When we get to the main passage, we'll be much slower. But we are called to be imitators. Here we go. 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, imitate me as I also imitate Christ. Philippians 3.17, join in imitating me, brothers and sisters, and pay careful attention to those who live according to the example you have in us. Philippians 4.9, do what you have learned and received and heard from me and seen in me. 1 Thessalonians 1.6, and you yourselves became imitators of us in the Lord. 2 Thessalonians 3.9, it's not that we don't have the right to support, but we did it to make ourselves an example to you so that you would imitate us. You're getting the idea? We are meant to see Christian godly examples, men and women, that we can model ourselves off. It's biblical. And here in this story, what I'm telling you tonight is that Priscilla and Aquila have a marriage that we can imitate for our good and for Christ's glory. However, we never imitate anyone 100% because nobody outside of Jesus is perfect. But there is a lot we can learn. So that's what we're going to be looking at. Now, I wrestled with what to call this message, but in the end, I ran with Priscilla and Aquila, a Christian marriage. I don't think we're meant to hold them up as special people. I don't think we're meant to hold them up as some kind of idol. I think they're a good example of what your marriage should be and my marriage should be when we keep Christ at the centre. They're not as dynamic as Paul. We don't read about them getting flogged or stoned. They are not apostles who were trained by Jesus himself. They're your marriage and mine if we put Jesus first. Right? An average Christian couple. Let's see what we can learn from them. I'm going to come up with uh, five things that we can learn from the marriage of Priscilla and Aquila. Now, before we get into those five things, who are they in our Bible? So if you do have your Bible there, open up to Acts chapter 18. We're going to read just verses 1 to 3. Acts 18, and we will look at 1 to 3. After this, he, Paul, left Athens and went to Corinth, where he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. Paul came to them, and since they were of the same occupation, tent makers by trade, he stayed with them and worked. So Aquila and Priscilla were tent makers, the same trade as the Apostle Paul, and they had already come to faith, and and we don't know how, the scriptures don't tell us. They had recently had to leave Rome because all of the Jews were kicked out. Now we know from other historical documents that the Jews were fighting among themselves, those who had come to faith versus those who had not. And the fighting had gotten so severe and so frustrating that the emperor kicked all the Jews out of Rome because he was sick of their fighting. So this was an empire-wide go to your room, right? This, this is what happened in Rome at this point. He just kicked them all out. He's had enough. So they had left Rome and come to Corinth and they worked in their trade there. 
What's interesting to note is it seems as though Priscilla worked in the trade as well, which is very unusual for that period of time, but we'll talk about that more later. So here's what I want you to picture. A standard couple working a job and following Jesus. They could be a husband and wife in the port working a small business together. And that's who we're looking to see what we can imitate together tonight. Apply what we can see in their marriage to our own. Firstly, they are Christ-centred. Their lives revolve around Jesus. Now, we will see this in the other ones as well, but it must be at the top because all of the others flow out of this. Everything this couple does is because they have Jesus at the centre. Their decisions about business, about where to live, about hospitality, everything is made because Jesus is at the centre. What is a Christian marriage? A Christian marriage is the union of two formerly dead people who have been given life by putting their faith in the death and resurrection of Jesus who paid the penalty of their sin. Separately, they both died to the desires of this world, died to the old life and gained life in Jesus. And when we are married, we bring those two people who've been born together in Christ, we bring them together with Christ at the centre with Jesus being the goal of your marriage, his glory. Now, in marriage, you have someone to encourage you, rebuke you, test your patience, help you grow in selflessness. If the future of the church looks grim, it's not because of COVID, it's not because ScoMo lost the election. It's certainly not because Jesus isn't on his throne. But it is impacted by marrieds nowadays who live entirely for themselves. They go to churches that entertain them but cost them nothing. They hang out with people who are just like them, which is really just a form of being in love with yourself. Unfortunately, in my 20-odd years of ministry, I've lost count of how many couples I see get married and then become infrequent church attenders. It appears they get married and then spend countless hours staring into each other's eyes or something. I don't know what they do, but they, they, they lose their time. Or maybe they work really hard to save for that deposit. But this is the exact opposite church of what it should be. A Christ-centered marriage means we both have Jesus at the center and encourage and push each other to Jesus. Marriage should mean higher church attendance and service than before because now we've got someone to encourage the other one when someone's down. Both push pushing towards Jesus. That is a Christ-centered marriage. It's worth thinking about on a wedding day when you make vows to include in them, I will encourage support in serving at church and in, in serving Christ and his bride. If you think you've found the right one and they are not completely committed to serving and growing in the local church, then they're not the one. They're the other one, the one that will drag you away from what Christ has called you to do. So right now in your marriage, be Christ-centered. If you're not married and you hope to be married one day, then think about this is what marriage should mean for me. So firstly, they are courageous. We're going to look at a couple of verses here, Romans 16, 3 to 4, if you have your Bible there. Romans 16, 3 to 4. Give my greetings to Prisca and Aquila, 
my co-workers in Christ Jesus, who risked their own necks for my life. Not only do I thank them, but so do all the Gentile churches. And Acts 18, 18 to 19. Acts 18, 18 to 19. After staying for some time, Paul said farewell to the brothers and sisters and sailed away to Syria, accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila. He shaved his head at Centria because of a vow he had taken. When they reached Ephesus, he left them there. But he himself entered the synagogue and debated with the Jews. Because they have Christ at the centre of their marriage, they have died to this world. And they are courageous. Remember, they had had to flee Rome and they had established a new life for themselves in Corinth. And now they are following Paul on a missionary adventure to take them away from their new home. Why, according to our passage? Because the small church in Ephesus needed godly, mature believers who were willing to come and establish the church. Mature, godly, married couple who would come and bring strength to the church. And because they're Christ-centered and they've died to this world, that's what they do. They pack up and they move for the glory of Christ and the sake of the gospel. Remember, they weren't set apart by God to bring the gospel to the Gentiles. This is simply a Christian marriage built on the rock of Jesus, putting Christ and his mission first, like you and I. No, but Paul said, they risked their necks for me. The scriptures don't actually tell us how they did that. But the best guess is, if you remember in Ephesus, Paul caused a riot. And you probably think, well, everywhere Paul went, he caused a riot, which is fairly true. Uh, but he did in Ephesus. And it seems as though in some way, uh, Aquila and Priscilla must have got in there and sheltered Paul or, or helped get him out of that trouble because he thanks them for risking their life for his sake. This is a mature, godly couple. If you're in a Christian marriage, this is you. Not everyone goes somewhere else. There were many who stayed in Corinth. But everyone should be willing and asking, how does our marriage bring glory to God? Your marriage is not your mortgage, your business, your job, your hobby, or even your children. Your marriage is to glorify Jesus. When is the last time you asked him how? Right, that's the question. Paul, he was able to leave them and move on. Why? Because he trusted a godly, mature, courageous, Christ-centered couple to dig in for the glory of God and strengthen the church. Right, that's what a godly married couple looks like. Sec, uh, secondly, they are commission motivated, right? Commission motivated. So if you have your Bible, we're just going to look at Acts 18, 24 to 28. Acts 18, 24 to 28. Commission motivated. Now, a Jew named Apollos, a native Alexandrian, an eloquent man, who was competent in the use of the scriptures, arrived in Ephesus. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in spirit, he was speaking and teaching accurately about Jesus, although he only knew John's baptism. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. After Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained the way of God to him more accurately. When he wanted to cross over to Achaia, the brothers and sisters wrote to the disciples to welcome him. After he arrived, he was a great help to those who by grace had believed. For he vigorously refuted the Jews in public, demonstrating through the scriptures that Jesus is the Messiah. Apollos was a competent man, educated, eloquent, he knew the scriptures and he taught them well. But he only knew the baptism of John. What does that mean? It means he only knew a baptism of repentance. 
He knew a baptism of law, but he was not filled with the Spirit. He didn't yet understand grace. Apollos was educated. He could talk accurately about God, but he did not know the good news that we are saved by grace through faith. He taught in the synagogue at Ephesus, arguing that Jesus was the Messiah in no doubt a technically brilliant fashion. And Priscilla and Aquila heard him speak. And as a godly, Christ-centered couple, filled with courage, they take him under their wing and begin to teach him the things of God more accurately. They begin to disciple him. This godly Christian couple are not self-centered, they are Christ-centered, which means they identify an opportunity to glorify Christ by discipling this man. What did Jesus tell us in the Great Commission? That we should go into all the world making disciples and teaching them all that he had commanded. And here we have Priscilla and Aquila living it out in their Christ-centered marriage, using their mature understanding to help this man of God grow in knowledge. And they do a good job. Our scripture tells us that Apollos goes on to have a big impact in the Corinthian church. And here's one for you. Many people believe that Apollos may well be the mysterious author of the book of Hebrews. So Hebrews is the most classical, educated Greek in all of the New Testament. And Apollos seems like a likely man to have written it. And Priscilla and Aquila played their part in teaching and discipling this man the truths of God. Christ-centered, courageous, Commission motivated. Is this your marriage? Is your marriage one that reflects and gives glory to Christ? The next one is complementarian. Now, I assume this church is complementarian. And what do I mean by complementarian? I simply mean this. That men and women are equal in value, dignity and worth in the eyes of God but he has given us different roles that complement one another. So that's what complementarianism means. Equal in worth, value, dignity with different roles. Husbands who lead their wives in Christ and wives who joyfully submit to their husbands. That is how the Bible teaches marriage should be. Unfortunately, we see a lot of false ideas about what this means in the world and unfortunately, even in the church. But what we see in Priscilla and Aquila is a beautiful picture of biblical complementarianism. Remember this, a chunk of their marriage was lived with the Apostle Paul living in their house, who taught most of what we know about complementarianism. Would anyone here feel a slight bit of pressure about their marriage with Paul sharing your house with you? Um, I know I would. Uh, So they lived with Paul there. They understood complementarian marriage. Paul taught it to them firsthand. And we see an example of what that looks like in their lives. Firstly, to the controversy. Six times they are mentioned in the scriptures. Twice, Aquila is mentioned first. Aquila and Priscilla. And four times we have Priscilla mentioned first. Priscilla and Aquila. Very unusual in those times to mention the woman's name first. So what is going on? Well, feminists jump to all kinds of wild conclusions, but I'll spare you the silliness of that. The two options that I think are probably the most likely are both plausible. Again, they they are plausible. I can't guarantee them to be true, but I'll share two options with you. Firstly, the romantic explanation. Anyone here consider themselves a romantic at all? No? No. Oh, there's a couple nods. Be brave, people. I do. Um, Yes, I've read Anna Karenina and loved it, all right? That's kind of a tragic romance. But anyway, still, um, I love romance, and this is a possible one. It's possible that Priscilla had been a ranking member of the upper-class society, nobility, as it were, that her family name carried weight, And therefore, she gets mentioned first. 
Now, drawing a rather long bow here, tent makers were lower rung societally. It was a profession often picked up by those freed from slavery. So perhaps Priscilla, the wealthy heiress, fell in love with Aquila, the former slave, and they got married and ran off together. And after Priscilla's family cut all ties with her, she then meant, learnt to make tents alongside Aquila, the love of her life. They are mentioned six times in scripture, never alone. Come on. That's a story, isn't it? It's beautiful. Someone should make a movie out of that. Anyway, I like that one. I think there's a more likely one, but I just had to mention that one anyway because I think it's, it's a beautiful story. Nonetheless, it is a complementarian marriage, even at that, because they're in it together. They may have different roles, but clearly they are in the journey of glorifying Christ together. As I said, I've been a pastor for the last 18 years most of our married lives. Pastor, elder is my ministry. But Beth understands it as our ministry in that she makes choices to support that ministry, to help fulfill that role. I simply could not do what I have done without Beth. We complement one another. Right? That's a partnership in the gospel. Serving the church in a Christian marriage is not negotiable. It is a partnership where husband and wife both give in their way for the glory of Christ. So perhaps, due to her social standing, Priscilla is sometimes mentioned first. The second reason, and probably the most likely, the one that most commentators agree with, is this. Maybe Priscilla was the greater academic of the two. She had a better grasp of the gospel than Aquila did, and she took the foremost hand in Apollos' discipleship. What do we do with that? What do we do if our wife is more intelligent or grasps theology more easily than we do? Well, thankfully, it's not a biblical requirement for us men to be more intelligent than our wives. For some of us, that's a wonderful thing. We are to be the strength that holds them to Jesus. That's what the Bible teaches. If this is true, your wife has a great grasp, then praise God. Now remember, this was not untoward. There is no hint of romance here between Priscilla and Apollos. No, Priscilla and Aquila were discipling him together. It is not uncomplimentarian, ladies, for you to have a better grasp of the scriptures than your husband. He should be putting his own work in, but he should also be encouraging you to know more, read more, and put the effort in to use your gifts to the best of your ability. Right? That is complementarian marriage. That's wonderful. Together, you can use your skills to glorify Jesus. A friend of mine went to Bible college with his wife. His wife topped the college in theology. He's a pastor. What do you do with that? It's a wonderful thing. They're both complementarian, and she uses the skills and gifts that God has given her for the glory of, of Christ, as does he. What does it mean for a man in that situation to lead his wife? It means he steers her intelligence to the glory of God. After all, the scriptures never paint a picture of the difference between men and women in intelligence. It does have certain stereotypes, though. Now, I'm going to take this moment to take us on a little tangent. Now, it's going to circle back, okay? So I'm just going to take us on a little tangent, and then we will come back. My main sport is spearfishing. Any other spearfishermen here, by the way? I wouldn't think so, but you probably wouldn't live that long. Anyway, no, um, I love spearfishing. And if we were to go down to the water tonight, night spearfishing is a wonderful thing, by the way. Uh, anyway, if we were to go down there, group of men, and uh, we burlied up the water to bring the fish in, and then we said, right, who's jumping in? And there's men who wouldn't. What would the other men say to them? Maybe good move. But also, the most common thing that people will often say is, man up. 
Man up. What does man up mean? Man up means there is something understood about masculinity, about being a man that we associate with courage. Well, I'm here to tell you, church, the Bible does that as well. This is a fact. We're going to open to 1 Corinthians 16, 13, really quickly. Like I said, this is a little aside, but it will come back. 1 Corinthians 16, 13. My Bible, the CSB, says, Be alert, stand firm in the faith, be courageous, be strong. Other Bibles will say, Be alert, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. Which one's right? We've got two different translations here. Well, the answer is they're both right. The underlying Greek word here, androthesne, says, the root of it is a word that says both a man and a mature man. That's the root of the word. So the word says a man and a mature man, and then it links that to courage. In other words, what the Bible is saying in this passage is to men and women. And it says, men and women be courageous, like a mature man. Right? That's what this word says. So men and women. Can women show courage? Absolutely. So this, Paul is saying, is men and women in the church show courage. What kind of courage? The courage of a mature man. That's what this passage means. Effectively, it could read... Be watchful, stand firm in the faith, man up, be strong. Right? That's kind of what this passage is saying. It calls, calls the readers of Corinthians, uh, so, sorry, to put away their um, inhibitions and fears and, and be courageous like a man. Now, that's not the only stereotype Paul has. You might remember in Thessalonians, he says we were gentle and caring among you like what does anyone remember off the top of the head what illustration does he use for gentle and caring like a mother caring for her children can men be caring absolutely but if we want to give an example of caring paul says like a mother caring for her children right now i think we should get this men and women both capable of courage but according to Paul, if we want an example of courage, that's what a mature man looks like. Here's where we circle back. Men, it's not a problem if your wife grasps theology more easily than you. Can take the upper hand in teaching the Bible in discipleship more readily, readily than you. The problem, men is to have a lack of courage to still get involved and lead the family. A lack of courage that would discourage your wife. That's the point of this passage. Man, God decides gifts and God allocates those gifts. What he says to men is, lead my wife to Jesus. She may well have those strengths, then don't you let your cowardice drag them down, but use your strength to hold her to Jesus. Right? That is what this passage is telling us. In short, Priscilla and Aquila, it's simply not a big deal. They have a Christian marriage. They are both valued by Paul as gospel people, both active in the church, both serving Jesus together. Sam and Beth, Beth and Sam, I don't care as long as it's prayerfully followed with, they are glorifying Jesus, right? That is what this passage is telling us. Center your marriage on Christ. Glorify Christ. Men, lead your wife's intelligence to the glory of Christ. Steer her, grow her, strengthen her, challenge her to use them for his glory. A Christian marriage is Christ-centered, courageous, commission-motivated, complementarian, and finally, charitable. 1 Corinthians 16, 19. Last passage, 1 Corinthians 16, 19. 
The churches of Asia send you greetings. Aquila and Priscilla send you greetings warmly in the Lord, along with the church that meets in their home. They were in Rome. They end up fleeing and having to go to Corinth. And in Corinth, they took in the Apostle Paul into their home and they opened up their ministry for him. Paul asked them to come to Ephesus and strengthen a fledgling church, and they do. And now we find out that they have opened up their home in Ephesus to hold the church itself. A Christ-centered marriage hangs loosely to material possessions. They are for the glory of Christ. There is nothing wrong with having a house, a car, material things, but use them for Christ's glory. Use them to build the kingdom. Quick aside, I came to faith and was discipled by a Christian couple who were Christ-centered in their marriage, putting Jesus first. I saw them use all they had for Christ with Christ at the center. And I was young in my faith and I was full of excitement. I came across a young man in the middle of grade 12 who'd been thrown out of his house. He had nowhere to live. And I said to him, I know a family you could live with. I literally rang them up. I said, hey, it's Sam. And they said, oh, Sam, so good to hear from you. And I said, I'm really excited. I found someone, an 18-year-old boy, to come and live in your house. How do you reckon they responded? They said, okay, okay. And then hung up and prayed an awful lot, apparently. That's what they told me later. But, you know, that's, that's fair enough. But um, they said, okay, why? Because their lives were given over to the glory of Christ and they used their marriage for him. It's pretty amazing to me. That was when I was a new Christian a long, long time ago. But most recently, that young man was an elder with me in my church. All right? Because a godly, mature Christian couple with Christ at the centre opened their home and discipled him together. Christian marriage is a partnership where together you encourage one another to be Christ-like. If this is not your marriage, neither of you, or just one of you, what do you do? The answer is simple and straightforward. Pursue Jesus. Jesus must be your pearl of great price, your treasure that you forsake all else for. Here's the thing, if you're struggling with courage in your marriage, if you're struggling with complementarianism in your marriage, if you're struggling with being any of those other things in your marriage, the answer is not to try and solve those things. The answer is to bring Jesus back to the center. If you both pursue Christ with all of your hearts, forsaking the world to have him, then all of the other parts of marriage will flow out of that. If you are noticing a lack of these Priscilla and Aquila attributes in your marriage, the first thing you must ask yourself is, what has shifted Christ from the center? I guarantee you that materialism, work, money, whatever it might be, something has shifted Christ from the centre. Pursue Christ first and your marriage will be built on the rock of Christ and used for his glory. That's the challenge of the marriage of Priscilla and Aquila. I finish with this comment. They were you, they were me. They could have been a marriage right here in Port Adelaide. And here we are, 2,000 years later, still reading about the impact they had in the church. Uh, that, that's the example of a Christ-centered Christian marriage. Let's pray. Lord, we bring our own family backgrounds and our cultural backgrounds and things we've learned from parents and things we've learned from TV shows and we bring that to marriage. 
We bring that to our understanding of marriage. Lord, I pray that you would help each of us to put aside those things and instead continue to show us from your scriptures how you would have our marriages glorify Christ. Lord, as men and women, as husband and wives, you've gifted and equipped, equipped us to shine the light of Christ to this community. Lord, I just pray for each married person here, for each person who hopes to be married. Lord, work in their marriage, build them in Christ, and may their marriages reflect the gospel and be used for your glory. Lord, there are those here who maybe will not be married again. Lord, use them to encourage and equip and strengthen the married people in this church. It's tough. We need help. Lord, use our single brothers and sisters to help build us up. Lord, I pray that you help husbands and wives to use their gifts for the glory of Christ. I pray that in your precious name. Amen. Thank you, everyone. If we can come up. Sing. Yeah, we'll finish off. We'll sing two songs. Um, Thank you very much, Sam. Thank you, Beth, for coming. Uh, Jake, thank you so much for putting the connection. And, yeah, the, it's, it's a challenge. And, yeah, I don't know, I've got the points, so if anyone wants the five points, I wrote them down. <laughs> See me. Um, yeah, thank you for your marriage, and I thank you for bringing Aquila and Priscilla close to us tonight. Let's stand up. We'll sing our last two songs. After the songs, uh, I just want to ask Greg to come up and do some announcements. Thank you.
I do have a few announcements, so let's get through them really quickly and then uh, we'll stand and close uh, in a word of prayer. Um, so membership candidates, uh, there's a list uh, that's growing and uh, we now have um, four different um, people or groups, uh, families, uh, Tim and uh, Anya Kipchuk, Serge and Alina Ivansov, uh, Matthew Limerov, that's all right, my microphone's been stolen. Good. And, uh, and lastly, uh, I don't know her surname, but uh, her name is Maria or Masha, um, Andre Fomienko's to be or fiance is she? So she has expressed a, a willingness or a desire to become a member of the church. So again, the, the, the idea of this list is just if people have some concerns or questions, uh, they're more than willing to talk to the people or to come and talk to us as a committee. So uh, that's what they're for. And probably in two weeks time or so, we'll have a members meeting after church uh, Sunday morning, just to validate those. Um, working bee, we had a working bee yesterday um, here in the church for those who came. A big thank you um, for the effort that has been put in. We haven't quite finished, but hopefully by next weekend that room in the back will be finished and uh, will be able to be used again. <coughs> um, we're planning another church camp sometime uh, this year. It's been on hold for a couple of years because of COVID. Um, so we're looking to... Uh, put something together. Um, it's a bit difficult because campsites are a bit busy at the moment as the um, community has opened up again. So, but we'll let you know hopefully in a couple of weeks time what we're planning and um, just to have some thoughts. So please pray about that. Um, administrative help, the church is still looking for someone to help, uh, to assist with organising and not organising, but some of the documentation and paperwork and uh, letters and those type of things and um, it would be appreciated if somebody could help. If they're willing to, please also let us know. Um, this evening, um, sorry, next Sunday evening. Where's our pianist gone? Ida, it's gone. Ne I believe so. Next Sunday evening after church, we'll be having a meeting here to plan the next three months or so of music ministry in the church, singing groups, music, and so on. So there are many new people that are here with us. We'll announce this again on Sunday morning. Um, please feel free to come along and to be involved, whether it's with playing some music or with singing, um, and your ministry will be a blessing um, to the church and to, to all of us. So thank you for that. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> sorry, just finally, I uh, just wanted to communicate... Thank you. Just wanted to communicate um, some organisational changes within the church. Um, just in the last few weeks, um, Sergei Kirienko, who's been the pastor of the church, has uh, resigned from that position. And we discussed this with our membership of the church. And we... Um, released him in peace so with our blessing uh, we've said thank you for his ministry his ongoing ministry for about 11 years and um, you know he's made a personal decision to do that it was hoped that we would have a pastor Dane Blount and his family to be here but unfortunately the visa application process has been a bit longer than what we thought and so it hasn't quite happened but in the interim, um, before Dane arrives, um, um, Anatoly Nikolaevich Kancharov and also Ivan Ivanovich, Vince, 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 good, Ivan Ivanovich, um, have offered to be um, take a more active role in spiritual leadership and to uh, help with um, the needs of the community and the needs of our church, uh, particularly in the Slavic languages. And as an organisation, uh, as the 
head person or the contact or the chairman or whatever you want to call it. Um, sorry? Spock. Spock. Yeah, Spock. Single point of contact. Um, Fred Turco has accepted that role in the interim until we, um, until we have a pastor and uh, the structure of the church returns to probably what we would probably consider to be normal. So that's kind of, um, that's kind of the, um, yeah, that's about the um, notices or, I've got one more, I think. Do I have one more, boys? Fantastic. All right. Apparently there's a ladies' movie night um, over at uh, the Henkel's house, Ida Henkel, on the 2nd of July, Saturday at 2 p.m. Here we go. All are welcome. What was that term you used? About male, male and female being... Complementarian. Complementarian. All are welcome. 6.30, Saturday, the 2nd of July. Um, Ladies' movie night. Uh, I think that's, I don't know, I think it's meant to be for the ladies, but uh, I guess if some, anyway, we'll finish up. Let's stand and close in prayer. Our gracious God, we do thank you for the ministry and the willingness of people in our community to be actively involved. Father, we thank you for Sam's ministry this evening to us. Thank you that we've been reminded of an example of a Christian marriage through Priscilla and Aquila. Father, I know that it's challenged me and I pray, Lord, that as we go from here this evening, that we won't fight against the Spirit as he speaks to us. Father, thank you that through your word we have examples of how we can live our life here today. How we can live our life here in this community in Port Adelaide. And Father, thank you that we as a church have a challenge and an obligation to minister to those, not only in our community, but also in this um, place where we live. Father, thank you for your word and the songs of encouragement that we shared in this evening. I pray now as we go and continue our... Um, communion together in the hall I just ask that you will continue to bless us and as we go into this week that you will be with us and we will remember to call on you each day we pray this in Jesus name amen and thank you very much